Well, good morning, guys. Good to be with you this morning. Like Larry said, my name is Donnie. Uh, I'm one of the pastors up at Mac, and um, so excited to be here with you guys. Uh, so many people this week, when they found out that Dan was coming up, were super excited. And then when they found out I was coming here, they're like, oh, tell, tell them I love them, and I'm praying for them. So they're, everybody at Mac wants you to know <laughs> that they love you and they're praying for you. I started to make a list, and then it got too big, so I was like, I'll just tell them Mac said hi. <laughs> Um, but seriously, though, it is, it is such a beautiful thing to see and hear what God's doing here. And I just, we joke a little bit, but I want you guys to know, um, I have the privilege of being part of the governing board up at Mac. And every time we meet, uh, one of the board members says, well, what's, what, how, how's Discovery doing? What's going on over there? Like, uh, as a staff, we meet every Monday as a staff. And, and not a Monday goes by where one of the staff says, hey, what's going on with Discovery? Let's pray for them. So, um, you guys are just such a special group who is loved and prayed for on a regular basis, and I want you to know that. It is just such a joy to be here with you guys this morning, and we're just excited. We're up there just watching what God's doing down here through you guys and in you guys, and we're praying for you, and so we're just excited to see uh, how God grows this thing and just the beautiful work that he's doing down here. Um, we're going to be in Mark chapter 8 today. You guys are going through Mark, and so if you have your Bibles, you can open up there uh, to Mark 8. Um, but even as you're turning there, one of the things, oh, I don't like this. <laughs> I don't like being reminded of my insufficiency. Anybody with me? I want to feel sufficient. I want to feel like I have everything I need. Uh, and this week was a great reminder of that, right? How many of you guys are still, anybody still without power? A few of us are still without power. I'm like, man, I can't cook. I can't refrigerate anything. Luckily, I have hot water. I'll take that. But I don't like being reminded of my insufficiency. I want to be sufficient. Um, and so, but this is how Jesus works a lot of times as we go through life. We're constantly reminded of our insufficiency. Uh, my wife and I, we have four kids. And so this is a regular topic of conversation between my wife and I as we'll go out on a date and, and talk about, you know, how are we doing as parents, where our kids are at. And uh, it just seems like a regular recurring theme as they move through different seasons of life, as I move through different seasons of life. You know, when they were little, it was like, okay, Jesus, help me just keep these kids alive. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm tired. Like, help me, Jesus. And then it seems like the minute we kind of find our footing, and we're like, okay, I think I got this figured out, they move into a new season. And I'm like, no, no, don't. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back to stroller. I know I don't have to do a stroller. I don't know how to do this. Uh, but now my kids, we have four kids. My oldest is 20, and, and I have a 17-year-old and a 15-year-old and an 11-year-old. So we're in, like, teenage, young adult season, and... And I just, Jenny and I, my wife, for Thomas today, I just feel out of my depths. I'm like, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> and so it's just like shoulder shrug, you know, Jesus help me moment. Uh, but we were talking with my daughter about this and just being real honest with her and just saying, you know, uh, her name is Gwen. I said, Gwen, just as like, you don't know how to be a 20-year-old. I don't know how to parent a 20-year-old. And so we have to just have grace for each other and figure this out. And so, but it's in those moments that we're reminded of our insufficiency. And it's a, it's a humbling thing. It's a painful thing at times. Uh, as we just move through various seasons of life and in various circumstances, we find ourselves faced with the fact that we don't have what it takes. <laughs> but in that, uh, this is just what Jesus does. We, we are led into these seasons where we are led beyond our ability into a season of the invitation to a deepening trust in God. Uh, and it brings up these feelings, right, of helplessness. I'm like, okay, I don't have what I need. And it's the last thing any of us wants to really be known for, right? I want to feel sufficient and, and useful and valuable and all these things. But as we move through this, uh, there's the invitation into a deeper life with Jesus. And that's how, that's how I, I want to view these things. I don't want to feel insufficient. I want to hear and sense the invitation of God to trust him in those moments. And so uh, you guys have been going through the book of Mark, kind of this fast-paced look at the life and ministry of Jesus as he's, uh, he's moving from one thing to the next and in that discovering who he is and what he's up to in the world. Uh, we have the benefit of being able to read through the book of Mark and see all these things looking back. But I think about this as I read through, especially the Gospels. Well, what, is, what was it like to be a disciple in that moment? You're like, you're waking up, you're like, okay, what kind of trouble is Jesus going to get us into today, you know? And is he going to get us out of it? Like, what's going to happen here, you know? Uh, so many times, it's like, I put myself in those disciples' shoes of like, oh man, they don't get the benefit of looking back. They're in the moment like, Jesus, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you causing so much trouble? And they're just along for the ride, but he always is up to something. Um, and that's a sharing that we can feel with him, right? That's a, that's a feeling that we can share of, of 
Jesus, what are you up to in this season? And are, are you going to get me out of this? I, I know you will, but I know it here, but I want to know it here, right? I want to know that you're with me and that you care about me and um, that you're faithful to lead us through these seasons, especially these seasons and moments of insufficiency. Because the reality is, church, it's an exciting adventure when we say yes to Jesus, right? It's not just a, okay, cool, I got my ticket, and so when I die, I know where I'm going. It's so much more than that. It is a life with God who is constantly wanting to work in us and through us. And in those moments, that can feel, we can feel kind of helpless. <laughs> we can feel way, we, in situations that are way beyond our ability, where we're forced to just say, all right, Jesus, I trust you. And this is where the disciples are at in this section of scriptures. This is where I'm at personally in life, and I'm sure most of you in this room are feeling in some ways uh, in situations like that that are beyond us, reminding us of our insufficiency, but also the power of God and his mighty resources in his abundance. Uh, when Dan asked me to share with you guys, uh, of course I said yes, because I, I just love the opportunity to be here with you guys. I'm so excited to see what God's doing. But, but then he shared uh, what section of Scripture we're in. And I was like, oh, absolutely, yes, 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 yes. Um, this section of Scripture, this story, is probably, of all the gospel stories, my favorite. Um, because I think it's just such a powerful picture, not only of ministry, of working with God, but of what God is doing in our lives a lot of the times. And I could, I could spend hours in this, in this section of Scripture. There's so much here. Uh, it's one of my favorite stories because the fact that uh, Jesus is here meeting needs. And I don't know about you guys, I, I'm a needy person. <laughs> I don't like to admit that, but I have needs. And the more I find myself looking at life, I'm like, man, Jesus, I, I'm a needy person. And I think about all the, the needs that we might have as human beings, whether it's uh, physical needs or emotional needs or relational needs, um, we have needs. God's designed us that way. And so we might not like to admit that, but uh, we do. And so there's a variety of ways we go about filling those needs, right? Some of them are life-giving and, man, satisfying. Oh, this is so good. Others are destructive and, and, and not satisfying. So there's a variety of ways that we can go about meeting these needs. But this morning, I want us to consider the question, as we look at Mark chapter 8, what is Jesus' response to our deepest needs? What is Jesus' response to our deepest needs? Okay, we're going to pick up the story here in Mark chapter 8. Just a little bit of backstory. Jesus is in this Gentile region, which is kind of a, a thing for Jesus. Uh, it's not expected. He's a Jewish rabbi. He's supposed to be going to the lost sheep of Israel, but he finds himself in, in uh, this Gentile region doing some miraculous work because he's just, Jesus is a wild one. You never know what Jesus is going to be up to, and so you're kind of along for the ride with this. But we see Jesus at work in an unexpected, seemingly unimportant place. All right, but before we jump into that, would you guys pray with me? Father, we thank you that you do work in the unexpected, seemingly unimportant places. And Father, there's so many of us here this morning that even as we talk about needs and insufficiency, Jesus, we feel that. We feel it at a soul level. And so, Father, we ask this morning, even as we look at this section of your word and the story of your son just doing miraculous things, Jesus, would you speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit, the beauty of your word. God, may we see you and fall more in love with you in trust. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles open, Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 1, it says this. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from far away. Right? I, I love how Jesus just starts out with this. He, he addresses their need. Right? Jesus, if you're taking notes, the first thing we discover here, Jesus is intimately aware of our needs. Jesus is intimately aware of our needs. He sees this crowd, and, and he's, he knows that they're hungry. He knows that they've been with him for a few days, that they've traveled from distant places, and he cares about that. Um, I, I'm a details guy. Any details people? Any planners? Yeah, I'm, I'm like, Jesus, how, what do you think? Like? I appreciate that he cares about the details, right? Um, he's aware of the practical stuff. Jesus has no interest in just being a spiritual teacher. He cares about the people that are in front of him. Um, and a lot of people can take this view of Jesus just being one of many spiritual teachers whose just only concern is religion. This, this section of scripture here shows us that Jesus is a good shepherd. He cares holistically about people and their needs. 
The more we discover about Jesus, the more we see a loving God who cares for what concerns us as his people. He's the good shepherd who cares well for his sheep. And this care arises out of an intimate knowledge, right? Uh, When we say knowledge, we're not just talking about religious information. Uh, When we say we know somebody, right, that can mean a lot of things. If I know somebody, there's a spectrum (laughs) of what that might look like, right? I can say, well, I know the president of the United States, meaning I know his name. (laughs) That's a lot different than saying I know my wife, right? That is a different thing. Why? Because relationship is involved. There's an intimacy there by spending time together, by talking, by laughing, by crying, all the things that we go through, all the experiences we have in relationship draw us into deeper and deeper knowledge of the person that we're with. We know them. Good times and bad can create this deeper, intimate knowledge. The difference in these two ways of knowing is relationship. And so God wants us to be aware that he knows us, right? Even more than we know ourselves, the psalmist, as he considers his relationship with God, talks about this over in Psalm 139. I would encourage you, if you have time later today, to just sit in Psalm 139 for a while. There's so much richness here. But he says this, starting off in verses 1 through 4, this is what the psalmist's response is to the reality that God knows him, this is what he says. He says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. The psalmist is is blown away by the intimate knowledge that God has about him. Not only the things that he does, but the internal life, right? The thoughts that he's gonna think, the things that he's gonna say, even before he does it, God knows it. Later on in verse 16, this is how he describes his life. He says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them even came to be. Church, that is intimate knowledge. That God knows everything we're gonna go through, every step we're gonna take, And for some of us, if you're like me, I'm like, okay, maybe I don't want you to know know me that deeply. There's a lot there that Jesus, I don't want you to know. But he knows us. He knows us, and in spite of all he sees, he loves us. (laughs) This is intimate knowledge. It's a knowledge that's rooted in relationship of a creator with his creation. This same creator is is interested in more than just a sermon in Gentile region. He wants to care for these people. He knows their physical needs and he calls attention to it. He comes as one who cares about what concerns us. But it's interesting, he doesn't stop here, right? He, He calls out this issue. Hey, these people are hungry. What does he learn? Secondly, we discover that Jesus is intimately aware of our lack. And he wants us to be too. He presents this this issue to the disciples. He says, hey guys, these guys are hungry. And I'm sure in this moment, I'm picturing myself being a disciple, hearing this, just panicking, right? Because we didn't plan for this. Jesus, you threw us a curveball. We don't have food for 4,000 people. But he draws attention to their their lack. Verses four and five, it says this. And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? Verse five, and he asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said seven. Jesus draws attention to to their lack, right? This immense need. Okay, guys, what do you have? I have seven loaves of bread. (laughs) Jesus, I don't know. I don't know that the math adds up here, right? He draws attention. I don't think he's doing this to, to belittle them or embarrass them. He's trying to teach them, church, a kingdom principle, Right? You see the need. You know, you're, you're aware of the need, not only my internal needs, but the needs of our community around us. And Jesus would turn to us and make us aware of these things, but then we turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, I don't think we have what it takes. Jesus, I, I don't have what it takes. I know my neighbor doesn't have what it takes. Jesus, what, what do we do here? We become aware of our lack. But Jesus wants us to understand that the things I'm calling you to do are beyond your own ability. That's the point. I didn't, I didn't just make you aware the need so that you can go off on your own and do the thing. I want you to trust me. As one who called you and knows your limitations, I know what I'm doing. Sometimes I have questions about that. I'm like, Jesus, are you sure? <laughs> I, think, I, don't, I think you picked the wrong person to, to come into this need and try to fix it. I don't, I don't know that I'm the guy. But Jesus says, I know you. I know the need. I know your limitations and your lack, Donnie. I know what I'm doing. 
He's pointing to the need for relational dependence between the creation and the creator. He wants us to trust him. But it's, just, it's much more than just feeding a group of people lunch, church. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 5, verse 6, and he says this statement. He says, while we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. He doesn't come to us as our Savior and say, okay, what do you, what do you got? What are you offering me in return for salvation? Paul says, we were powerless. We had nothing available. There was nothing in us that, we, that God would be like, oh, this is, this is a good trade. Nope. He says, while we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. The very thing that we needed most in the restoration of our souls, in the healing and the healing of relationship between creation and creator, the bridge that we could not gap was sin, right? That chasm, we could not fix this. There's no amount of, of work that we could do to be good enough or, or, or lovely enough for our creator to say, all right, you're mine now. Because that's not the point. We are unable to, in and of ourselves, deal with sin. So Christ had to come and do what he did on the cross and on the grave to, to resurrect us, to make us brand new and to, to deal with the issue of sin. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine about this, and this idea of the, the need for something outside of ourselves to come. Uh, a good friend of mine, he was recently diagnosed with cancer, and so we were having this kind of heavy conversation over coffee. I was like, man, how, is, how are things for you? Um, not only physically, but just spiritually. Like that, I mean, I, getting hit with something like that can cause... A lot of us to just doubt. Be like, okay, God, where are you? And so he was sharing kind of his feelings with this. And he said, man, I'm just, I'm learning so much more about the gospel in this season. And I said, what do you, what do you mean by that? He said, man, I just, I think about what is in my body. My body does not have the ability to fight this off. And so I need a power that is outside of me to, to come and heal. And he's going through chemotherapy and a lot of things that are, that are outside forces that are coming to deal with this issue in his body. And he said, man, I, I go through this, and it's just, he said, it's, for me, it's just such a radical, radical picture of the gospel that we, in and of ourselves, can't heal ourselves. We need something more powerful from outside of us to come. And it was just such a beautiful thing to hear, uh, just so encouraging, because I just, I picture that season, and just the doubts, and, but he was so encouraged in that, that God was at work in his soul, not only just in his body. And, but the point of it is, he had to acknowledge his need and realize that he didn't have the ability to do that. And that's a humbling thing. It's a humbling thing to be faced with the reality that we don't have what it takes. But that's a step that we have to take. And that step can be scary, but this, this section encourages us in something to ease our fears a little bit about that. Because none of us wants to admit that we don't have what it takes. But what does Jesus do when this, when this section, this, this, uh, this need is presented and the lack is there? What does he do? Does he chastise the disciples? Does he get angry? Because they're not prepared, no. <laughs> we discover, thirdly, if you're taking notes, that our needs and lack trigger the compassion of Christ. It says there that Jesus he had compassion on these people because they were hungry, because they were far from home and didn't have any food. His compassion is triggered. He is not an angry God who is fed up with our inability. He's not an angry God who's, who says, man, I just wish you guys would, would be more ready for these sort of things. That's not who he is. He's a loving father who delights in caring for his children. He meets their needs. He sees it, he knows it, and he delights in coming and meeting us in these things. So much so, church, so much so that he would come and experience humanity and all the ups and downs that we experience, right? Hebrews uh, chapter four, verses 15 and 16 tell us this. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are and yet did not sin. We have a God who understands, who understands our deepest needs. He's not aloof. He's not distant. He says, oh man, I, I know what it's like to be you. And so what do we do with that? The, the writer of Hebrews encourages us, let us then, because of these things, approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Our lack doesn't, doesn't cause distance from God. It causes God to move closer, and he invites us to come and receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. The author of Hebrews is encouraging us to move from just information about the need, right, on our lack into relationship. I want you to come. Approach the throne of grace like you would approach a loving father who wants to care for you. 
to find mercy and grace to help. And this is the exciting part about Jesus. You just don't know what he's going to do. You just don't know what he's up to next. As he sees this need and he makes it known to the disciples, they're aware of their lack. His compassion is triggered and he invites them to come and be a part. That's the next thing. If you're taking notes, Jesus invites them to participate. He doesn't say, all right, guys, you, you take a seat. I got, I got this. He says, all right, what do you have? We have seven loaves. All right, bring them to me, right? <laughs> Jesus, in all of his love and delight, uh, invites them to participate. Verse six, and he directed the crowd, it says there, to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves And having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these should also be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And he took up the broken leftover pieces, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people there. And Jesus sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. He says, all right, guys, uh, we're going to serve lunch. Give me what you have. I'm going to break it and then give it to you to distribute to the people. He could have just rained manna down from heaven, rained sandwiches down. But no, he says, I want want you guys to be a part of what I'm doing. I'm inviting you into this, even with your lack, knowing the need and with your lack, I want you to come and I want you to be a part of what I'm doing. Jesus delights in this. I love that Jesus doesn't draw attention to what they don't have. He draws attention to what they do have. He didn't say, well, you guys don't have enough. I guess I'll have to fix this. He says, no, what do you have? We have seven. Okay, bring it. Bring what little you have and watch what I'm going to do with it. This excites me. He invites them to trust him with everything they have and watch what he's going to do in this unique and powerful work. I think about this. I think a lot of us can resonate with this. We want to focus on what we don't have, right? Jesus calls us to these roles as, as missionaries. He calls us in the Great Commission to go out and make disciples. Well, Jesus, I, I, don't, I don't like talking in front of people. I don't like sharing my faith. I feel awkward. I feel embarrassed, all these sort of things. We focus on what we don't have. But Jesus says, no, 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 that's not the point. I want you to focus on what you do have because it was never about you having enough in the first place, <laughs> It was about you recognizing there's this great need in front of me and I don't have it. And Jesus says, let's go. (laughs) Let's do something wild. I love what Paul tells us that Jesus is, that God's power is made perfect in our ability, in our excess, in our abundance. Nope, in our weakness. It's almost like God is looking for an opportunity to do something exciting and wild in someone's life. And he's like, I just want someone who says, I don't have what it takes. And he's like, I got you. (laughs) Let's go. Let's do it. This is what he's doing here with these disciples. He, he invites them to be a part of this, this miraculous work of meeting people's needs. Um, and so I think about you guys as a church. I, I was driving over here this morning looking around at this amazing community that God has planted you guys in. And, and I, look, I look out at you guys, I'm like, okay, this little ragtag group of people, what is Jesus going to do? <laughs> Not because you're, that, you, know, you, know, you have abundance and, and an excess and all these sort of things. It's because you're like, all right, we're just a small group who loves Jesus and wants to be on mission for him in this community. And I think about the power of God moving through all that you guys do have, not what you don't have. So I'm excited to see, I hope you are too, what God is up to on this side of town. But um, going on, Jesus, Jesus, so Jesus feeds the crowd, he gets with his boys and he gets in the boat and he goes across to another region. And uh, this is another part of this. We see another need pop up here as he gets uh, involved with a crew that... Um, kind of like to cause trouble with Jesus. Verse 11, if you have your Bibles. Uh, The Pharisees came and began to argue with him. Surprise, surprise. Seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got in the boat again, and went to the other side. These guys have a need. They're like, all right, Jesus, we, we have a need. We want you to prove to us that you are who you say you are. Just, just you, got, you, got to, you got to do this thing. We're, we're in control. And you've got to measure up to what we say. We find in this that Jesus doesn't, meet, uh, Jesus doesn't meet every need we have, but he meets us in every need we have. Right? Jesus is not a cosmic vending machine where we go and dictate what he does, right? And then he just dispenses it out. Again, this is all rooted in relationship. He wants us to come and trust him, trusting not only that he's going to meet our needs, but that his plan is best. 
See, the Pharisees don't have room for that. They, they don't have room for what God's doing. They, they know what God should do, and they want to they keep account. All right, you gotta, you got to prove to us that you are who you say. you got to do a big thing. Which is so ironic, and we read the story of what just took place, right? 4,000 people got lunch out of nowhere. <laughs> and they're like, we need to see a sign. It's like, what? you're missing the whole thing, man. Jesus doesn't meet every need. He meets us in every need. And so we, we come, as, as followers of Christ, we come to situations where we think we know what's best. Anybody? I have a list in my prayer. I'm like, all right, Jesus, here's, here's the way you're going to, you should do it. Here's, I got it all planned out for you. Here you go. And Jesus is like, oh, cool. I love you. Great job. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm going to do this because I love you more than you think I, I do. Um, do you trust me? Do you trust me not only to meet your need, but in the way I'm going to meet your need? And there's going to be moments where I say no for now. I, I'm up to something bigger than you can even imagine. And I want you to trust me. But in those moments where I have those needs, the invitation is, okay, God, what are you up to in my life? Not just, not just meeting these physical needs or relational needs or emotional needs, but you're doing something in me. And I want to be tuned in because I love you and I trust you. These Pharisees had no room for that. Um, and, and this next section I love because how many of you guys, uh, it takes more than once to get it? Anybody? Sometimes it takes me a while, I'll be honest. Like, I, I hate saying that as a pastor, but I'm like, maybe let's do that again, Jesus. I, don't, I didn't get it the first time. <laughs> Jesus turns the, the Pharisees down, he sighs. He's like, man, I just can't believe you guys are so close to God, but you're missing it. Him and the boys get in the boat and head off to the other side. Verse 14, now they had forgotten to bring bread, which is, again, ironic. And they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, verse 15, saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. What Jesus is talking about there, uh, Luke tells us, is hypocrisy. These guys say they love God. They say they're all about, but they're missing the work of the kingdom. They are so clueless as to what I'm doing. They're so far from me. So he says, beware. Beware of this leaven. And this, this leaven was, a, was like yeast that would, would be part of the bread-making process. Right? Bread's a big theme here in this section of Scripture. And so he says, beware of the leaven. Verse 16, they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. They're like, oh, you brought up bread again. Oh, man, we, we don't have any bread. Maybe this is, oh, man, we're busted. <laughs> Verse 17, Jesus, aware of this, says to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? <laughs> He's like, guys, why? <laughs> why are we on bread again? Like, what is going on here? How, don't you perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes to see and having ears to hear, do you not remember? Verse 19, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. <laughs> and the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Guys, oh, it's about so much more than just bread for lunch. Do you trust me? As the bread of life, do you trust me? Do you trust that I'm at work in something so much bigger than just feeding lunch to 4,000 people or meeting some Pharisees' demands on showing them a sign? Do you believe that I am who I say I am? That I'm the son of God who came to seek and save that which was lost? That I'm the bread of life that whoever eats of me will never die? The question is, do we believe that? Do we believe that Jesus, who knows us intimately, who created us before any, any days of ours started, he knew exactly everything that we would go through? Do we believe in all of that, that he loves us and that he cares for us? That every need that we, we become aware of, all of a sudden we realize our needs and our inability to meet those needs. Do we trust God to do something? That's what the invitation is. In all this, do you trust me? As the bread of life, do you trust me? And so that's the question. As we, as we kind of wind down our time here at church, I have three things I want you to consider in light of this section of scripture. First off, what are the needs around you? What are the needs? We interact with people on a daily basis. So oftentimes we can be so focused on ourselves and what we're doing that we miss the opportunities around us. Jesus didn't miss this opportunity. He saw that these people were physically hungry and saw this was an opportunity for him to do something. First of all, what are the needs around you? Jesus is concerned with what concerns us, and that also means the people around us. The disciples in this moment are learning to see things and people as Jesus sees them. What has he made us aware of in our community? 
right? Um, we, were, we were doing this the other night as, as uh, I got home from a trip and I was tired and I realized no power was out and everyone's doing their thing. And, and uh, my wife said, hey, we should just text the neighbors. We live in a cul-de-sac. Let's just get everybody together. Like, we all need to eat dinner. <laughs> Let's just figure it out together. So we invited our neighbors, and, and my, one of my neighbors was like, oh, man, I'm already pulling my grill out front. Let's do this. And so we sat around, and we just we started talking about what we don't have. <laughs> a lot of us didn't have power and water, all these things. And then, um, and then all of a sudden, the topic turned to, well, what do you have? One of the neighbors says, oh, man, I have this generator that's running a fridge, so if anybody needs to put stuff in the, in the fridge, I got space. And our water heater was still on because it's a billion years old, so I'm like, we have hot water, guys. Like, Anybody needs a hot shower, you can come to our house. We all of a sudden, because we were in community, all of a sudden realized, man, we have so much here to offer. Instead of focusing on what we don't have individually, corporately, man, there's so much here that God could use. And it was just a really cool opportunity of ministry. But what are the needs around you, right? Second thing I want you guys to consider, how has God specifically designed you to respond? Each of us are made, uniquely made, to play a role in the kingdom of God and what he's doing in our communities. We see the needs. I can easily focus on what I don't have, right? Well, I'm not, I'm not able to speak in front of people. I'm not, a, I'm not a prayer. I'm not an evangelist. But what are you? What do you have? Well, I have a job where I'm connecting with people. Okay, that might be it. Or man, I really, I really love just taking care of people, hospitality. Okay, what could God do there? What do you have? How has God specifically designed you to respond, right? Instead of easily focusing on what we don't have, Jesus calls us to bring what we do have. What has God entrusted to you that you can leverage for his kingdom to meet those needs? Third question, um, as we close, where do you need to trust Jesus' sufficiency? Not your own ability, not your resources, but it's that moment of, of realizing, God, this need is way beyond me. I need to trust you. What is that moment for you? What is that area where you need to trust his sufficiency? Maybe for some of us, it's the need to multiply our little to meet the needs of others. For others, maybe it's that he sees our needs and will bring relief in his timing, church. What is that for you? Whatever the case, this story helps me to remember that Jesus sees my needs and cares about me and is up to something in my life. The invitation is then to just tune in and to ask, all right, God, what are you doing and how do you want to use me today? Would you guys pray with me? Father, we thank you so much uh, for the story, Lord, of just you doing something miraculous with the little that your people have. God, that is such a beautiful picture of our lives. And so, Father, I pray for everyone in this room. Maybe there's some in here, Jesus, that they don't know you. They don't know what it's like to, to know you in relationship. Father, I pray that even this morning you'd be at work in their hearts, drawing them to yourself in love, that they would see that they, they are beautifully designed by you, uniquely created to play a role in what you're doing, Beyond that, Jesus, you love them. You know them intimately. And in spite of all that you see, you delight in your creation. So Father, I pray that this morning that, that they would just experience your love, Jesus, that by your spirit, you break through all those walls and defenses that we've put up to keep you out. That we would hear your still small voice speak into our hearts saying, this is my beloved son and daughter in whom I am well pleased. And that in that, you would draw those people to yourself. Father, for those of us who, who are following you, who are doing our best to trust you, Jesus, I pray for those areas which we feel insufficient. Lord, we, we are aware of the needs around us, but man, we, we just have such a hard time trusting you. I pray that you meet us, that you'd remind us even through the story this morning that you are so much greater. Lord, you just want us to bring what we have. So Father, I pray that we would do that, that we'd trust you with our little watching you turn it into abundance. Father, for this church, this beautiful church that you've placed in this part of our community, God, the amazing things you have in store for them. God, I pray that they would step out in faith, just seeing this community as you see it, Lord, seeing all the opportunities, not the limitations, Jesus, but the opportunities for you to do a mighty work through this group of people. I love you. We love you. We're so grateful that you're at work in us and through us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.